We now need to look at a third numbering system, so hexadecimal, we've looked at binary and decimal, we're now looking at hexadecimal, which is a base 16 numbering system. And this means it's got 16 digits. And a key thing to realize straight off the bat is that it shares 0 to 9 with decimal. So it's got 0 to 9 as its first 10 digits. The final 6, representing 10 through to 15, are represented with capital, or it doesn't have to be capital, but letters A, B, C, D, E, F. So Again, this is where you're kind of thinking of the digits as symbols because C is representing 12 in hexadecimal, E is representing 14, and it goes up to 15, 0 through to 15. So long streams of bits, i.e. a very long binary string, is difficult to understand. It just doesn't make much sense. Zeros and ones are quite, you can't interpret them very well. So we use hexadecimal as a way to simplify them. So hexadecimal is there to simplify binary, that's why it's used, it, otherwise it would be a bit random. And an important factor is that bit patterns tend to have lengths in multiples of four. We looked at nibbles, bytes, it tends to be in multiples of four. And hex is useful because it can represent four bits with a single hex digit, so it shortens the length, because every nibble can be replaced by just one of these hex digits. So a relatively long binary number or binary string can be shortened into decimal, but even but shortened even more to hexadecimal by a factor of four. And this kind of looks like you've got 3000D4, but it's got nothing to do with thousands, as we'll look at these columns are completely different. Like last video, let's do some conversions then, first of all between decimal and hexadecimal. So if we want to write 31 in hexadecimal, we need to, well let's just talk about, assume we're going to do the table method that we did in the last video. The columns in this case are going to be 16 to power zero, because 16 is now our base in hexadecimal, 16 to power one, and 16 to power 2 and so on but because it's 16 it's a much these numbers get much larger so 16 to power 0 is always going to be 1 and then we have just 16 and then we have 256 and then we have a much larger number which I can't do in my head so let's just get rid of this so these are our column headings basically and in reality you're basically just going to be dealing with 16 and 1 to be honest so we can get rid of this for the time being so our table is straight away very compact which is kind of a point so it can help just to write down what these extra digits mean so a b c d e and f so we're going so this is 10 this is 11 12 13 14 15 and that's all we go up to not higher than that so first of all right let's do the same process as before like if we we're going to binary so we write down 31 and we go how many times does 16 go into 31 well it goes in once only so we actually only write one here but this is where it differs to oh that's good that's only where it differs to binary so once the remainder is the 16 the difference between this is 15 and so now we're looking at how many times is one going to 15 well one goes in 15 15 times and now we actually have a, a dedicated symbol to represent 15 so we can write down f here and this is our answer our answer is 1f because to do the reverse process we've got one lot of 16 so 16 plus 15 lots of 1, because that's what f represents, and this would be 31. So I just tidy up my mess, and we can move on to look at 210. So even for a much larger number, we don't need the third column, because 256 is still larger than 210, so this would just be 0 in that case, like it would be in this case. So leading zeros again don't matter. So we've got 16 and 1 as our two columns. So this sort of math becomes a little bit trickier. So how many times does 16 go into 210? Well, you could do this with factorial division, but 160 is 10, and then 64, so it's going to be 13. It's going to go in 13 times, and of course we need to write down what 13 is, which is D. So we write down D in this column, which is what D represents. And then we need to find the remainder, so 210 minus 16 times 13, which is 208. So 210, 208. So clearly remainder of 2, and then 1 goes into 2 twice. And that is our answer, D2 in base 16. Right, so doing the opposite, first of all, let's put what looks like 27, but it's not because we're in base 16. We want to put it back into decimal. So again, you've got to be very careful because this looks like a decimal number, even though it's not. This is representing two different things. So we can do a little table again, and it might be helpful. So we've got to remember that 2 is representing 2 lots of 16, and then 7 is 7 lots of 1. So basically, we just multiply them together and add them up. So 2 lots of 16 plus 7 lots of 1. So 32 plus 7 is 39. And that's our answer in base 10. So there's no obvious relation between the two numbers in two different bases. 
Let's now do the same with 9C. So again, let's do a little table, though of course you don't have to, if you can just ignore it. So 9C, remember C is gonna, so it might help just to do A, 10, B, 11, and C is 12. That's what C represents. So we've got here 16 times 9 plus 1 times 12. 16 times 9 is going to be 144 plus 12 is going to be 156 in base 10. We've ignored binary up until this point, but binary is really why hexadecimal exists. So first of all, let's convert 1101 into hex. We kind of need to intermediately go into decimal first. So we need to work out what this number is in decimal. We can do this pretty quickly without doing our table, so or pretty much are. So we know this is the eighth, the eighth column. So this is going 8 plus 4 plus 0, 0 lots of 2 plus 1. So this number is 13 in base 10. So we know that A is 10, B is 11, C is 12, and D is 13. So 13 in base 10 is the same as D in hexadecimal. So this number via the decimal conversion is D. So when we have a longer binary number, this is where the kind of trick or the reason why hexadecimal is used, and that's why it can make things a lot easier and shorten it. So what we could do here, following this, we could convert this long, long number into decimal first and then convert it into hexadecimal. But that's not a very uh, fun thing to do. Instead, we can convert each nibble separately. And the reason this, this connection goes back to the fact that with four bits we can represent, so this is 15, so we do have to convert each nibble to, to decimal first. This is 15, this is 3, this is going to be 15 minus 2, so 13 like we just did actually. So with the maximum value a nibble can have, we can convert this to the largest hex di digit. So any value a nibble has basically we can cover it with a hex digit. That's where the relationship comes from. So basically we need to convert these all in base 10 to hex decimal. And we can do this very easy. So 15 is going to be F, that's the largest digit. 3 is going to be just 3. And 13, as we've done, is D. So we've got to, the only thing we've got to worry about is keeping the order. So this is, we'd write it together. So D, 3, F in hexadecimal. So the key bit is you can isolate each nibble and just convert them separately, although you do have to go via decimal, but that's not very difficult. That's pretty arbitrary. Instead of converting this long number and wasting a lot of time. And it all comes down to the fact that you can get 16 values out of 4 bits and we have 16 values in hexadecimal because it's base 16. Instead of writing the suffix of 16, that might be possible if you're typesetting something or if you're programming, a way to signal that something is hexadecimal is often just to write 0x in front of it and that signals that that is base 16 and it, this is not part of it, this is just signaling that it's base 16. So finally then let's just do two examples of putting hex into binary. So we've given B, we've got to go via decimal again. So B is 11 in base 10, that's what B represents, if you remember. And then we need to put this in binary. So we need to do our little table again, like we did in a previous video. And 8 goes into 11 once, remainder 3. 4 doesn't go into 3, so we write 0. 2 goes into 3 once, remainder 1. And then 1 goes into 1 once. So the answer is 1011 in base 2. So now we've got a much larger number, A14 in hexadecimal. And again, we can convert this whole number into decimal, but it doesn't make sense because we can isolate each one. So we just do each one separately. So A in 16 is 10 in base 10. And then 1 is just 1. And then 4 is 4. So now we need to put each of these into binary. We can use our existing table just to help us here. So 8 plus 2 is what gives us 10. So this is the same as 1010 in binary. This is just 0001 in binary. And you get very quick at doing this once you are a bit familiar with it. So then 4 is just 4. So 0100 base 2. And again, this is so important that you leave in the leading zeros because they're, they're nibbles. That's what they are. That's, what, that's how this trick works in the dealing with them in units of 4. So we've got to line them up properly in the correct order. So 1010. 0, 0, 0, 0001 and 0, 0100. 0, 0. So if you converted this whole number, it would be the same as this number. So this whole number as a unit works because we've split it up and left in for leading zeros. So to save you a lot of time, make sure you split up each hexadecimal digit and convert it separately. 
So that's it, I recommend you do some practice yourself, make up some questions and then use online converters to check your answers.